Bow for prayer with me together. Father, thank you for your church. Thank you for how you put it together. Thank you that we can benefit from it, be part of it, serve together with brothers and sisters in Christ to advance your glory and the fame of your name in this community and in the world. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think we said the Sola series was over, but we lied. Today, we still have one left, but it's not a Sola. This is going to be sort of just a, uh, a, a sermon about where and, and what the Reformation did for us as churches and how it helps us as local churches and where it developed and why we are here today as a result of the Reformation. So this morning, this sermon is going to be kind of like a hockey game. Not that we're going to get into a fight here in stage or anything like that, but three periods. Uh, It's going to be one-third history lesson, one-third sermon, and one-third charge to the church. So we're going to kind of delve into history a little bit and see uh, where we came from and why that relates to today and why that's important. And so if you'll take your Bibles to start out with today and turn to the book of Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 is where we're going to start today in our text of Scripture. Genesis chapter 12. There's a very dangerous view that people have of the church today where they divorce the idea of the Christian life from the organized church. People are trying to live in isolation as a Christian outside of the life and community of the local church. And that is not how God intended it to be. People think of it like this, I'm a Christian, and then I decide to be part of a church where really those things are one and the same. They go together. People view church as just a preference issue. I go to church, I find one that I like, and for the older generation, I want to find one that's got traditional music, and for the younger generation, one that has a good nursery, and for the singles, one that has lots of good-looking available singles, and like that, right? It's all based on preference. But I want to advance for you today the idea that there's a fusion between being a Christian and being part of the local church. If you're trying to live in a divorced fashion, the Christian life from the local church, you are literally running against 4,000 years of history of God working with people. In fact, even longer than that. Because right after creation, God created man and woman and wanted them to be part of something. He placed them in a structure. And from the beginning of creation onward, we, God's people, have had the responsibility to steward and manage the authority of God on this planet. And that has never been done outside of some kind of structure. Garden of Eden, what did God say? You can do anything you want except what? Don't eat fruit off that tree, right? There was structure. After Adam and Eve sinned, from Adam to Abraham, God set up a system where inside of families, they governed their families and they had a system of sacrifice and there was something to do with their sin and it was very strict as we find out from Cain and Abel and Cain didn't do it the way God wanted him to do it and God was angry with him and it resulted in the first murder. There was structure involved. And then Abraham comes. And when Abraham came, it was more structure And Abraham comes and God makes a covenant with Abraham. And look with me in your Bibles at this covenant that God makes with Abraham. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, from your kindred, from your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And you can imagine Abraham's descendants thinking, sweet, we've got God's blessing on our lives. We can just live however we want to, just kind of do our own thing, and God's going to bless us. Not quite like that. Turn over a few pages to Genesis 17. 
we see a little more explanation on what it meant to be in covenant with God, to have God's blessing in your life, to steward and manage the authority of God on the planet. Genesis chapter 17, starting in verse 9, and God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout all their generations. This is my covenant you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between you and me. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall certainly be circumcised. Are you catching a theme here? God's given enough explanation. How many people? Everybody. You mean even the ones? Everybody. Even my son? Everybody. What happens if we don't do that? Verse 14. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people because he has broken my covenant. What does this mean? This means that in order to participate in God's covenant, to be God's people, to steward God's authority on the planet, you had to become part of the community, and the entrance right to become part of the community was, for them, thank God it's not today, circumcision. What happens if we don't do it? Well, there's a little play on words here, if you see in verse 14. Any uncircumcised male, anybody who decides not to be cut, will be cut off from his people. See the play on words? Everybody getting that? You need me to say it again? I think we're good, right? If you decide not to do this, you're done. Wow. Wow. I can imagine someone saying, yeah, but come on, I don't really like structures. I don't really like organizations. I don't like institutions. I don't want to officially become part of something, God says, too bad. Because I take my authority seriously. I take my plan seriously. This is my plan. This is my authority. I'm placing in the hands of humans, and you have to do it my way. You have to become part of this institution. In that case, it was a nation. And then once you're part of that nation, there were more rules, and they abided by the law. And when they sinned, they had to go to the priest, and they had to make sacrifice, and they had to celebrate these holidays and all these different things that went along with the Jewish system. There were structures in place to govern the people of God. And so ever since the beginning of time, there's always been structures in place to govern the people of God. Jesus gathers his disciples around as he's getting ready to leave, and he gives them what's called the Great Commission, and he says, go therefore into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teach them everything that I've commanded you, etc., etc. Jesus established the church before he left the planet, and he charged the disciples with making disciples and organizing local churches, and the disciples in their first hundred years after Jesus left were busy creating local churches that were made up of disciples. You see, the structure didn't go away when the law went away with Israel. There's still structure today. A couple hundred years after Jesus left the planet, this structure of the church had become a monstrosity. And then fast forward to 1,500 years after Jesus left in the day of Martin Luther, and this structure had become a giant monstrosity, abusing its authority, and it had central power located in one person in one place on the planet, and it disseminated that power throughout all the other priests and other bishops and so on throughout the planet, and the structure that Jesus had set up had become abused and misused, and that's what Martin Luther helped us reform in the Reformation. How did that happen? Well, in June 15th of 1520, Martin Luther received what's called a papal bull. What is a papal bull? I can tell you that it's not a quarter cow for Martin Luther to put in his deep freeze. It's not that. A papal bull, what is that? It is an official document from the Pope. It's not just the Pope's opinion. It's the Pope writing something on behalf of Jesus Christ. 
signing it. This is Jesus writing, so to speak, handed it to Martin Luther, and it said in this, you have all these things that you've written, 41 sentences specifically they took out of Martin Luther's writing. They said, you must recant these things or you're going to be excommunicated from the church and you have 60 days to do it. What do you think Martin Luther did? Do you think he trembled in fear? Oh no, what am I going to do? Do you think he went and he tried to talk them out of it? You know what Martin Luther did? Martin Luther took that document publicly in front of a group of people and he burned it. Like I said last week, Martin Luther had some guts. Well, soon after that, he was excommunicated from the church. January 3rd, 1521, he was no longer a part of the church. He was placed outside the church, and you think to yourself, well, no big deal, right? Martin Luther, just go down the street, find a new church. I'm sure there'll be another pastor that would love to have. Guess what? There were no other churches. It was just one church. If you were put outside that one church, you were done. And even more than that, You were done with the church, but they also taught in that day that to be apart from the church, there was no salvation, and so you had to be part of the church to be saved, and so Luther finds himself with no church and supposedly no salvation either, but Luther fought back, and Luther began to teach, and he began to rethink this idea of the church. In fact, Luther did not really like the word church. He thought it kind of conveyed too much of the organizational structure. He preferred the word gathering or assembly. And so Luther began to teach differently about the church, that it's not a structure, it's an assembly of believers. And Luther was asked once, what's the definition of the church? And he replied this, why a seven-year-old child knows what the church is, namely holy believers and sheep who hear the voice of their shepherd. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that defines the church. It is not a pope that defines the church. So Luther began to think differently about the church. And the key for us here today is this. The church is not a physical institution that you join in order to gain salvation. The church is not a physical institution you join to gain salvation. In fact, the church is not a building And so, officially today, I want to officially today say ha to the old lady in my home church that used to tell me, son, you don't run in God's house. All right? Let's put that on the record. How many many people had that same experience? Boy, you can't run in the Lord's house. And I can just imagine a little precocious me as six years old saying, well, this really isn't the Lord's house. You know, something like that. Because it's not. Did you know that? This is not God's house. If you think of it as God's house, you really are espousing and carrying over Roman Catholic theology. And that's what Martin Luther helped us fight for, is that this is not God's house. This institution is not God's house. That God does have a house. He has a temple. And guess what the temple is? It's right here. It's right here. God dwells in us as a gathered people in his name. And so the church is not a physical institution that you must join in order to be saved. And so here's some questions here for you this morning. Number one, oops, that's not supposed to be there. Neither is that. There we go. How about that? If the church is not a physical institution, if the church is not a physical institution, then we'll talk about that here in a moment. But the Roman Catholic theology said, no, the church is a physical institution. In order to be part of the church, you have to join the physical institution or you are outside of Christ. And Protestant theology said, no, that's not the case at all. The church is the gathered people. So here's the point, ready? You are not saved by being part of the church. You are part of the church by being saved. That's a very important differentiation You are not saved by being part of the church. Instead, you are part of the church because you're saved. The moment you accepted Christ as your Savior, the moment you received the new birth, a changed heart, you became part of the church. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. But back to history. The Reformers took Martin Luther's teachings on the church and they began to spin it a little bit more. And they began to say that a church that no longer preaches the true gospel of grace, justification by faith, is no longer a true church. And so they separated from the Roman Catholic Church and established what they considered to be the true church that taught justification by faith, that those who are saved 
and justified are part of the church. You're not saved by being part of the church. You're part of the church by being saved. Then a guy named John Calvin came on the scene, and he developed this more for us. Before coming to Geneva, Switzerland in 1541, John Calvin spent three years in Strasbourg where he learned under a man named Martin Bucer. And under Martin Bucer, Calvin developed this thought that we still use today, that there are two aspects of the church. There is what's called the universal church or invisible church. What is the invisible church? church. The invisible church or the universal church are all people that have been saved from the beginning of the church in Acts up until now. So people in heaven, people here, we're all part of this thing called the church universal. But then there's this local manifestation of the church and that is individual bodies of believers like we are here today who constitute the church. And so John Calvin helped us understand this separation. There's the universal church and the local church. The moment you're saved, you join the universal church, and shortly thereafter, you should join a local congregation as well. What happens on the spiritual level should happen on the physical level. So John Calvin helped us develop this idea, and along with that idea was the concept of the priesthood, that there is no need for an institutional priesthood, that there's no need for human priests to come between us and Jesus, that we are the priesthood, that we together are priests. Open your Bible back to First Peter, if you will. The book of 1 Peter in the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2, as you heard that read earlier here today. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 and verse 9. This is the language that Peter uses. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 and verse 9, it says, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. So there we go. Peter's talking about the institution of the church, but notice what the building blocks are for the church. They are not brick and mortar. They are you and me. We are the building blocks of the church. You are being built up. And it says, as living stones, as living stones, God's putting us as living stones in place Building this church, notice what he says next, to be a, say it together, to be a holy what? Look at your Bibles, ready? One more time, to be a holy priesthood. Did you know that you were a priest? Did you know that you're supposed to wear the little collar with the white thing on? No, I'm kidding, you're not supposed to. Did you know you're a priest? Peter says it right here, a holy priest priesthood. He says the same thing in verse 9. Look over at verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal, what? Priesthood. Priesthood. And so, John Calvin, Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli began to relocate this idea. Wait a second. The church is not the brick and mortar. It's people. The priesthood are not men that come between God and us. It's us. We are the priesthood. We are the priests of the church. And so the key point here is that everybody is a priest, not just a special exclusive class of people. And so the second question is this. If the priesthood is not an exclusive group, then what? First, if the church is not a physical institution. Second, if the priesthood is not an exclusive class of people, then and I'll answer that in just a moment, but let's talk about the priesthood for a minute. What is the priesthood? What do priests do? Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, Peter captures this idea of Exodus 19, 6. It says, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation, as God says to Israel. Israel had a priesthood that mediated the relationship between God and man, but it also said that the people in general were priests and they were to make God famous in the culture around them. In other words, they were supposed to mediate God's presence to other people. And now Peter says that we are priests, that we are the priesthood. And priests mediate God's presence and so we, that's our job now, we are to help bring God's presence to each other 
and also to a watching world around us. And so in the Reformation, we have a relocation of the priesthood. Jesus did not abolish the priesthood. Jesus relocated the priesthood. There's no priesthood like it was in the Old Testament. There's no church that should have a priesthood. We are the priests. That is our job to mediate the presence of God to each other and to the world around us. Martin Luther was also fond of quoting Malachi chapter 2 to show that the principal task of priests was to teach people the Word of God. And so if we are the priesthood, then that means our principal task as people with each other is to mediate God's presence through teaching each other the Word of God. That's what we are to do with each other, is train and sharpen and teach and speak to each other in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, teaching and admonishing the Word of God to each other. That is our duty as priests of Jesus Christ. Someone said it like this, we stand before God and intercede for one another. We proclaim God's word to each other. Luther said this, being priest to one another means sharing Christ by proclaiming his word, interceding for each other in prayer, and sacrificing for each other. And so, if there's no institutional physical structure, and if the priesthood is not an exclusive group, then why do we need a local church? It's a good question, isn't it? Why are you here this morning? Are you here just to listen to good music? Are you here because I am just so entertaining to listen to? Probably not. Why are you here today? If you are a priest, if Jesus is your high priest and you are a priest and you don't need people to come between you and God, then why are you here today? Good question, isn't it? And So I want to teach you this key point, the key thought for today is this, sola theology should never result in solo Christians. We ask the question, what's the purpose of the local church? And the solas of the Reformation, Christ alone, faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone, the priesthood is here, it's the people, we don't need the institutional structure, etc., etc., that should not lead to rank individualism. It's not supposed to be solo Christianity, just me and God, just me with my Bible. I can do church on my own because I am a priest. Uh Uh-uh. It's not how it's supposed to be. It's not how Jesus designed it. You see, the priesthood wasn't abolished. The priesthood was relocated. The structure wasn't abolished. The structure was relocated here. And let's talk about that just a little bit. Why and what are the reasons why sola theology should never result in solo Christians? First of all, I want you to see this. Priesthood terminology is always in the plural. Sorry to throw English terms at you. Plural means more than one. It's two, three, four. It's many, okay? And so we have here in verse 5 and verse 9, what does it say? What does Peter say in verse 5? You yourselves, like living souls, are being built up into a house into a holy priesthood. Not as holy individual priests, but in a holy priesthood. Verse 9, as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people, a group for his own possession. The idea is corporate. The idea is not individual. By us becoming priests, the idea was not for us to be our own pastor, to our own families, to do church on our own, to go into the woods, or even better, the golf course. Can I get an amen? To have church on a Sunday morning and to offer my sacrifice of a horrible round of golf for the glory of God. That's not the purpose. We're not supposed to be just fractured an individual in our church life. The priesthood is plural. In fact, I really don't see a lot of proof at all from Scripture that there's any sense that the priesthood is individual. And we do talk about the priesthood of the believer, but it doesn't mean that we're supposed to just take our Bibles by ourselves and interpret the Scripture any way we want to. The priesthood is mutual. In fact, there is no priesthood. There's no function of the priesthood unless you have other people 
I am a priest to you, you're a priest to me. Together we read and understand the word and interpret it together as a group. We teach and mediate God's presence together through the word. There's no individual sense of that at all. I want you to see secondly the word royal. You are a royal priesthood. Not just an individual agent priest, you are a royal priesthood. And the word royal denotes some kind of organization. Royal, kingly, regal. Like in England, the royal family. There's great organization in royal families. There's people who are successors and people who are over other people. There's some kind of organization to this, and so it is in the church. We're a royal priesthood. That doesn't mean there's no organization. In fact, that means there is organization. What is that organization? Well, we'll talk about that in a moment. Also, number three, this idea of a holy nation has got to be qualified in some way. You are a holy nation. And so the point is, is that these churches, these local churches are supposed to be composed of believers. There's got to be some way to figure out who's a believer to ratify or validate testimonies inside of some kind of a membership that constitutes the priesthood here in this local entity. Number four, authority must be held with some kind of accountability. So Jesus has given this priesthood, us, he's given us his authority. Okay, think about that for a moment. You, together with me and everyone else, we here together, we hold in our hands the authority of God Almighty. We hold the keys of the kingdom of heaven that whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And that relates to this holy nation, this royal priesthood, letting people in and out of some kind of a structured membership. That's the point of this. We hold the authority of God in our hands. There's got to be some organization to that. We can't just let anybody walk in and say, hey, I'm a believer. Great. Let let me give you the keys of the kingdom. You take the authority of God in your hands. There's got to be some kind of organization to that. And so, sola theology should never lead to solo Christianity. God did not abolish structure. God relocated structure. And instead of that structure being top down, guess what? The structure is now bottom up. We believe that local churches are congregationally governed, led by elders who are assisted by deacons to do the work of the ministry. The authority of God is held here. The authority structure is bottom up. And so to become a part of a local church is no small matter. You are taking in your hands the responsibility of stewarding the authority of God on this planet. It's a serious matter. So, where are you in this? Where are you in this discussion? Well, let's look a little bit at history again. As the Reformation continued to spin and grow, there was a group that came along called the Anabaptists. Guess who the Anabaptists were? The word Anna means re. And the term Anabaptist was somewhat of an insulting term. And so they called people Anabaptists. In other words, oh, you re-baptizer. Why do you think they called them that? Because they took people who were baptized as infants and said, no, we shouldn't do this anymore. Instead, we should baptize them as adults or believers, as conscious believers in the gospel. And so they became known as the Anabaptists, as an insult first, but then they grabbed a hold of that term. There was a man by the name of Griebel who learned under the reformer named Zwingli. And Zwingli began to teach Griebel and his companions the Greek New Testament. And as they began to study the Greek New Testament, they suddenly realized, wait a second, we don't see infant baptism anywhere in the New Testament. In fact, it seems that everybody that was baptized was baptized after they made a profession of faith in Jesus. Eureka! Guess where we came from? We have roots in that movement. And so they began to baptize people after a profession of faith, and they were persecuted for it. Many Anabaptist leaders went to prison. Many were executed. There was one leader named Menno Simons. He was a former Catholic priest from the Netherlands. He spent much of his life on the run. He would preach to secret communities and baptize people in lakes at night after dark. Can you imagine those baptism services? 
It'd be awesome. Baptize, and someone starts to clap. They're like, no, it's, shh, it's got to be secret. You can't make any noise. They were baptizing people at night into this movement of the Anabaptists, and that continued to grow. And the idea from that kind of came, and this is where we come from. Anybody who's like non-denominational, we all have baptistic roots, meaning we believe in baptism after salvation. We believe that what makes somebody part of the church is regeneration, receiving a new heart by the Holy Spirit, a conversion experience. Menno Simon said it like this, They truly are not the true congregation of Christ who merely boast of His name, but they are the true congregation of Christ who are truly converted. Listen to what he says next. Who are born from above of God by the operation of the Holy Spirit through the hearing of the divine word. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what we teach That there's some point in your life where you come to understand the gospel and it has nothing to do with the fact that you were baptized as an infant. That you understand the gospel, you trust, you have faith, and you're born again, you're reborn. And at that moment, you're made part of the church. And so the Anabaptist movement then began to think differently about church. It's not a group of people that are brought into the covenant as infants. It's a group of people who voluntarily are baptized that assemble together. And the, group, the church is a gathered group of believers together. Well, if it's a gathered group of believers together, they began to take discipleship more seriously, and they began to think of things like church discipline, of confronting one another in sin, and this idea of putting someone outside the membership to win them back to Christ and to bring them back in someday. And so discipleship, membership, running a church like we run churches came out of the Reformation That ball that Luther started pushing down the hill, (laughs) and it never stopped from there. So the question today then to end is, why join the church? Why join the church? Well, there's a lot of reasons. I'm just going to give you two this morning. Number one, it's because it's what Jesus wants. That's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? Someone asked me, why should I join the church? Because Jesus wants you to. How do you know that? Well, because I read my Bible. And Jesus says, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. You see that happening in the early church. They're baptized and added to the church. And there's some kind of a community that they join. And there's discipline and discipleship that happens inside that community. And we're holding the authority of God in our hands. And God is running his authority and running his church, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. And if that's the case, then we have to have some way of knowing who are the authorized people to hold the authority of God in his hands. Right? So that's why we do membership. That's why membership is important. The New Testament was written under the assumption that Christians are members of local churches. The New Testament was written to congregations, not individuals. Membership was implied in the New Testament. Why? Because Jesus has organized his church, not from the top down, but from the bottom up. And it's an important, important aspect of the Christian life. Secondly, I think it mobilizes us for action. To be members of a church gives you something to do. It mobilizes you for action. What are you supposed to be doing as a member? You're contributing to this body. You are priests. You're part of a priesthood. Preaching and teaching and telling each other the word and sharing the word with each other and helping each other grow and mediating the presence of God to each other. In our culture today, churches are seen more like a fast food restaurant. Drive in, get fed, maybe get a little toy from a Happy Meal, drive back out, I'm good to go for another week. That's not the way Jesus designed it. It's a gathered group of believers in Jesus Christ that come together to be priests to each other, to grow, and to tell each other the excellencies of Jesus Christ. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 again. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. The last phrase is important, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so there's a charge here. As priests with each other, we're supposed to declare the excellencies of Jesus to each other. We're supposed to declare the excellencies of Jesus to a world around us. A pastor that I know put it like this, we are a conduit, not a cul-de-sac. 
This church is not supposed to be a cul-de-sac where we come and just run in circles with each other, a little country club where we have our friends and do our thing here. We are supposed to come here not as a cul-de-sac, but as a conduit to share and tell the excellencies of Jesus Christ, not only here, but out of these walls too, and across the world to share the good news of the glory of Jesus Christ. And so what ways can we become a better conduit. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, I quoted it earlier. Jesus says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them all that I've commanded you. And so what's the plan? The plan is this. Go out, make disciples who are baptized, who join local churches, who are taught and trained to go out to make disciples, who are baptized, who are taught and trained to go out to make disciples, who are baptized, who are taught and trained to go out to make disciples, who are baptized, who are taught and trained to go out to make disciples, who are baptized, who are taught and trained to go. Need me to go on? Do you get the idea? Just this cycle, this ongoing cycle of what we are charged to do by Jesus Christ. This is not a cul-de-sac. I am supposed to charge you from the Word to train you, to teach you to be good disciples, and a good disciple reproduces himself or herself in someone else. What's our mission? Our mission reflects Matthew chapter 28 perfectly, making more and better disciples. That is what we are trying to do, making more and better disciples. We want to see more people come to the glorious knowledge of Jesus Christ and understand the truth of the gospel, and we want the disciples that we have to become better disciples. And so what are we doing? What are we doing in this process? Well, we continue to preach strongly the Word of God. We continue to make the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God central. Why? Because our view of the priesthood, our view of the priesthood says what are priests supposed to do? Priests mediate God's presence through God's Word. That's what we're supposed to do. And so the teaching of the Word of God remains central in this church. The pulpit remains central. The classes continue to teach you the Word of God because that is our main job as priests. We also continue to see salvations and baptisms, and I'm so happy that people are continuing to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Never underestimate the financial contributions that you make to this church. When you see people in the baptismal tank having come to know Jesus as their Savior as a result of the ministry of this church, you had a part in that. It takes money to fund a ministry, and the result of that is fruit in people's lives, the fruit of salvation, the fruit of sanctification, the fruit of growth and discipleship. What we're doing here is very important The starting point class, we've got a new one starting up here this Wednesday, is a very important piece of what we do because we want everybody who comes through these front doors to understand the basic truths of the Word of God and to understand the glories of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so keep connecting with people, keep inviting, getting them involved in starting point. We're also continuing to work on reproduction as a church. We've got a church plant in Phoenix. Some of you have asked how that's going. It is going well. They are meeting together in a public place in the city of Avondale. I would challenge you, be praying for our group that's in Phoenix. Be praying for them as they reach out. Our two guys, Tyler and Dave, they're doing training, church planter training. It's a nine-month-long training process. They're learning about planting. They're learning about the next steps. They're bringing this core team along with the goal, hopefully, Lord willing, fall of 2018 to launch officially, publicly, Soteria Avondale. Right after they started meeting in that public place, they sent me a picture. They had, and not everybody's here in this picture, but they had 17 adults and seven kids in that core team. Be praying for our folks in Avondale. I know a lot of local churches here in the state that don't have 17 adults and seven kids, and so we're off to a good start. That's a good core team. But they need more people. They need to start winning people to Christ there in the Phoenix metro area. And so what are we continuing to do, and what more can we do together as a church? Well, a couple things. Number one, membership. And I hope that I've made a strong case this morning that we are supposed to be members of a local church, that structure is important, that God did not abolish structure, that we are not 
free agents of Jesus Christ, that we are together in a priesthood, and the priesthood is corporate. So if you have not joined the church, I would encourage you to do so. If you've come here for a while and are not a member, let me just ask, what are you waiting for? Today, during the second service, this is an advantage you all have for being early risers and being first service people. Today, during the second service, Pastor Zach is starting the membership class in room 106. Go attend. Overwhelm him. That would be so much fun to see his face being overwhelmed with a packed house, not knowing what to do. I would love that today. (laughs) Go join that class. It's this week and next week, the membership class. It's very important that you join because God thinks His church is important, and He's built a structure that's not top-down, but it's bottom-up. And if it's bottom-up, then we have to do this right. We have to have some way of knowing who fits where and the authority structure and how things work. Number two, we need to increase the number of people that are serving in the congregation. We have tremendous, tremendous numbers in terms of our numbers of people serving. In terms of other churches, I know churches that run very small percentages, we run a very high percentage of people that are actively serving in the church, but we can always use more If you look on your Connect cards, there are places to serve. You can see all these little boxes to mark. Our numbers have swelled this year in large quantity. We have a lot of people attending the church. As the numbers swell, praise God, so do the needs. Uh, There's not a week that goes by that we don't pray on Tuesdays in our staff meeting. Lord, send us some more workers for children's ministry. And children's ministry is different today than it was in the old days. When I was at my first church in Waterloo, I was an associate pastor. We we had a couple of times we honored people who had been serving in Sunday school, and we gave them awards. They were retiring from being Sunday school teachers. Some of them had served for between 50 and 60 years every Sunday for 50 to 60 years. And I remember handing that award over to this old lady saying, couldn't you have done it five more years? No, I didn't say that. Okay, it's not that way anymore. Our children's ministry, uh, Trent, Pastor Trent and the people that are in charge of that, they schedule folks for one Sunday a month to be in and help out with a class. And so it's, it's very doable. It adapts to the uh, culture that we have today of people uh, being gone and having different things in their lives. So just think about that. We need to continue to increase service. We, we're going to have more opportunities to connect with Arizona Uh, Jared, our youth ministries director, is planning next summer, Lord willing, a missions trip to Arizona. Am I correct on that? That would have been terrible if that's not true. Podcast second service, please. Uh, So next summer, uh, youth to Arizona, possibly to help do some canvassing and some ministries there to reach out to people. We're also exploring other church planting and revitalization opportunities. I'm very interested in this idea of church revitalization where a church that's small, struggling, has no hope, no future, would come to us and say, help us. I would love to be part of that process to help revitalize and get local churches on their feet. What more can you do? I would say it like this, connect and invite, connect, invite, connect, invite in your life with the people around you, in your neighborhoods. I'm going to say it like this. Build bridges of grace with people that are strong enough to support gospel conversations. Build bridges of grace with people that are strong enough to support gospel conversations. What I'm telling you to do is to not hand a tract to a perfect stranger and say you need to ask Jesus into your heart. I'm not asking you to do that. I've got some neighbors Right now, I've had a lot of conversations with them. I've had zero spiritual conversations yet. And you're like, what? You're a pastor. I know. That's part of my strategy, right? I try not to tell them that I'm a pastor, but somehow that word travels fast. I mean, people move in that neighborhood and they know we're marked. I don't know what the deal is. Maybe I've got like a cross on my forehead or something, but we're marked. They, oh, hey, you're a pastor. They found out. Shoot. You know, I didn't know, I was, you know, try to, try to blend in, try to wear shorts and, you know, whatever, that they find out somehow, you know. I'm not out in my yard mowing the grass in a suit, okay, I can tell you that. They find out. But I haven't tried to cross that bridge yet. Just building bridges of grace that Lord willing sometime can support gospel 
conversations. And I'm praying that God will open that door. And you should be praying that too in the people in your life. That shouldn't go on in perpetuity. Uh, there got, there's got to be some point where you really try to talk to somebody. But just connect, invite, connect, invite. Invite them to church. Invite them to get involved in the starting point. And to come here, get them in the starting point, attend the starting point with them so that they can hear and understand the word. Then I also want to start working this year on ways to creatively connect with our community, corporately, doing some things that gets our name out in the community and helps to make some bridges corporately, not just personally, corporately makes bridges with our community. So those are the things coming up this year. This is kind of the fall kickoff sermon. There's a lot to do, a lot for you to do, potentially. Everybody here has a next step. Let's bow for a word of prayer.